All right. Welcome to the afternoon rising economy conference panel. And one I've been looking forward to uh, for all month, for the whole month, titled Indigenous Intellectual Property and the Story of the Cowich and Salish Sweater. This session is part of the third annual Rising Economy Conference and is just one of more than 20 sessions focused on the future of where we live and work in this wonderful city and region and gaining clarity in a time of discord and incredible disruption. My name is Tom Gerzinchuk and I'm the publisher of Capital Daily which is Victoria and the South Island's largest news source. If you're not already one of the 55,000 citizens who wakes up with Capital Daily seven days a week in your email inbox, make sure to subscribe today at capitaldaily.ca. Capital Daily is so honored to be sponsoring Rising Economy for the third year in a row. And we're honored to work with the wonderful South Island Prosperity Partnership team to help tell the stories of livability, economic prosperity, and entrepreneurship in Greater Victoria year round. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you to your moderator, Christina Clark. Christina is the Executive Director of the Indigenous Prosperity Center, a not-for-profit com not committed to the self-directed economic vision of First Nations and Indigenous peoples throughout Southern Vancouver Island. Before joining the IPC, Christina spent 27 years with the Songhees Nation, serving as Senior Finance Manager executive director, and finally, is inaugural CEO of the Songhees Development Corporation. Welcome, Christina, and over to you. Thank you, Tom. And I invite the um, other speakers to, to turn your videos on now. Uh, we're here to talk about Indigenous intellectual property, and in particular, the couch and sweater. I think many of us from this region are very familiar with the uh, what we now know as a couch and sweater, uh, but what do we really know about it? And what do we know about the Indigenous intellectual property uh, in general? So we've got an amazing panel with us today, and I just want to give you a few um, technical points before we get into our discussion and introduce our panelists. Um, we're going to be going about halfway through the conversation before we start accepting um, questions, and you can put your questions through the Zoom Q&A below the video. The session is being recorded, and if you choose, you can submit your questions anonymously. And to interact with attendees, you can use the Zoom or Wova chat. The production team will monitor the Wova chat and Q&A for those of you joining us through that app. And finally, if you're posting your takeaways to social media, please use hashtag Rising Economy 2002. So as I said, we've got an amazing panel. I'm really excited to speak to uh, these folks today. And we could, we could spend our time going out through these bios because these are some amazing folks. So I'll, I'll forgive the abbreviation. Uh, we have Ron Rice, the Executive Director of the Victoria Native Friendship Center. Ron is from Cowichan Tribes, and he is also co-chair of the Victoria Urban Reconciliation Dialogue. And he has served six years on the Board of Governors for Camosun College, ending as board chair. And in 2020, he accepted an appointment to the Board of Governors for Island Health. Thank you for joining us, Ron. We have Dr. Susan Thiessen, Assistant Professor to in, in Indigenous Community Development in the School of Public Administration. Her research examines First Nations cultural approach, approaches to work and the relationships of administrative practice and policies to employee engagement for First Nations people. A strategist in Indigenous governance and organizational development transformation, Suzanne has extensive experience creating and implementing programming and to decolonize governance and management practices in complex stakeholder environments. And we have Joni Oil Olson joining us today. Joni is a member of the Sartlet First Nation, where she served for 15 years as an elected council member. And she also served as the CRD liaison for the Wasanic Leadership Council. And her focus in her political career has been on Douglas Treaty rights. Joni is also an artist and an entrepreneur. She is a fourth generation knitter whose Salish fusion knitwear was featured on the Dragon's Den. And we have Luann Neal. Luann is a Quag Youth artist and arts advocate. She is a member of the Quag Youth and Mama Lila Kula tribes of the Kwakwakwa people. She is a practicing visual artist in acrylic and oil painting, textiles, jewelry design, digital design, and more recently wood carving. Luann also worked for over 30 years in policy and program development in the area of arts, culture, languages, and community development. As a volunteer arts advocate for the past three decades, she lobbies for support and services for Indigenous artists throughout British Columbia. So I think you'll agree with me that we, we have a wonderful panel here today to talk about these matters. So I'm very excited to, to have you here. So we've got about um, 
an initial 20 minutes before we start accepting uh, questions from the audience, and I'm sure there'll be many. Um, so I, we've drafted a few questions to, to get the conversation started, and I expect this is such a deep, broad topic, we could be hosting a conference just on this topic. <laughs> so we know we're going to skate across the top a little bit, but I, it, I think it's uh, it'll be a tantalizing kind of treat for us to, to want to learn more based on what we learned today. So for the first question I'm going to ask to Ron, what is the history of the Cowichan sweater and who are the knitters? So there's some debate about when we started calling it Cowichan sweaters. They they were called something else, a word that's no longer appropriate. Um, and at some point they started referring to them as Cowichan sweaters. But in actual fact, there are knitters from throughout the Salish territory who, um, who picked up this craft. Uh, something that has become sacred uh, through the generations. Um, it actually was introduced uh, by the Scottish, the Irish, and the English, and it was mastered by the blanket weavers and basket weavers uh, of our of our people, who took very easily to uh, to this new craft and in incorporating uh, family motifs and designs uh, into the garments themselves. Thank you, thank you, Joni. You're a knitter. Can you tell us about, about being a knitter? What does knitting mean to you? And how did you how did you become to, to be a knitter? Hi, it's Quechel. Um, my name is Joni Olson. I am uh, Tsewit Sotsia um, by way of my Co Salish name. Um, I suppose I should have maybe updated my um, bio a little bit, but I'm policy negotiations manager for the Kusanich Leadership Council and the owner and operator of Salish Fusion which I've just changed the name from knitwear to uh, collective. So a uh, business here out in the Wissanich territory. Um, I'm a fourth generation knitter um, and uh, it sort of started with my great grandmother world war and during the world war sort of would take her uh, mitts and socks up onto West Saanich road and put them out on a blanket to sell. Um, so my grandmother, Laura Olson, um, you know, grew up for the entire, you know, uh, for the entire sort of generation or multiple generations of um, of uh, what the the um, life of or the history as we know it today, and um, I started uh, sort of learning about it when I would visit my grandmother, and she would be knitting and watching the young and the restless and fe feeding the neighborhood children, and I was just fascinated with her. Um, knitting as I would sit and watch. Um, and then my parents in the 1980s opened um, a little shop in our yard called Mount Newton Indian Sweaters, which my grandfather named. And um, and so I got just a large opportunity as a child to uh, look at knitting, knitted goods from um, numerous Wasanich knitters that would come and sell to the shop and have their wool spun at the shop and zippers put in and uh, my parents would package them up and send them off to places like uh, Bounce Springs Hotel and and um, um, other places around the United States. So I was really raised in it, but I actually picked up the knitting needles for my first time. Um, well, little bits as a kid, but in my later 20s and 30s, and uh, it was just a natural it was a natural uh, skill of mine. And I've never really, like I've, I've, I've learned by watching. Um, I've never really been taught. I don't know how to read. I know how to read like prints patterns, but not like knitting instructions. And um, like my grandmother, I love innovating. So, you know, I remember her knitting. Uh, she wanted to knit a baseball cap, um, you know, with the, with the brim. Um, and she had several iterations of what uh, the baseball cap would have been. Um, and so I started, you know, uh, the, which is what the fusion is. I started sort of uh, felting some of the products and um, and sort of modernizing them in a way, I suppose, and um, have created sort of my own uh, take on it, but still very much knit that sort of um, um, uh, what what people see today as the couch and sweater, which is that sort of standard three pattern um, with the void space in between knit is very popular still for what knitters want. So 
a little bit on me as a knitter, um, I guess it has to do a lot to do with sort of the, my past um, in, in sort of community and knitting. So, thanks. Thank you. And that makes sense because the, the sweaters themselves were an innovation. So it, it's, I'm not surprised that the, the culture is passed down the innovative, innovative nature still within it. Oh, um, oh I, I believe I remember my grandmother, she was, uh, she loved a uh, secondhand store and um, yard sale shopping. And I remember driving her um, and with her and walking behind somebody that was wearing a sweater. And it's just like, oh, what, you know, what is that? Oh, I'm, I'm going to try something like that. And so there was very, you sort of see in, as an artist, I think we all kind of do that as artists. And I have ne I only actually started considering myself a bit of an artist a few years ago, really looked and been inspired by other people's work. And then, you know, have this sort of desire to want to go and try something um, similar. So yeah, that just reminded me, sorry. Thank you. No, don't be sorry. That's the it's the, that kind of fascination about how the artist mind works and that's where in, innovation comes from and the uh the it was wonderful designer at the indigenomics she conference two weeks ago that talked about uh, she saw someone with polka dots on and in her mind salmon eggs and there's a whole line of of um clothing now based on those salmon eggs from the being inspired by polka dots one day um now, Ron, I wanted to ask you about what it is about the industry that you hope to disrupt and how do you hope to do that? So by highlighting stories like that of Joni's family, you know, this is a this is a group that sort of took control of uh, their own uh, financial destiny and their own business by by controlling not only um, the product that they were putting into the garment but the actual sale to the to the final consumer it's it's an unusual story it is happening more and more today there are some people who have become very successful in this space a, a very small handful uh, the rest rely on retail and what we're trying to do is you know is get this out of the high-end tourist trinket and put it sort of back into the iconic uh, national garment that uh, it once held. You know, this is something that the um, leaders of the day would give to heads of state and visiting royalty. And today it's something that um, tourists are picking up for a bargain um, in different shops around the region. So we're looking at creating um, a, an image in the eye of the consumer of this handcrafted, hand spun, um, very meaningful garment that has become sacred for our people. We want to make sure that the knitters themselves are earning a fair uh, and livable wage. We want to make sure that the knitters have uh, a constant, consistent um, quality uh, access to a reliable wool source. And, and we want to help the consumer understand that this is something that you will, if you care for it, you will hand down and generations of your family will wear it. And therefore it is worth, name the price. We're gonna be doing a test this winter to find out what that price is. But, you know, we have friends at Ecologist and he he sold a sweater last fall uh, that was a black cardigan sweater that he made on a machine in Vancouver and he sold it for $489 and he doesn't understand how a couch and sweater with so much history and uh, so much expertise that is, you know, hand done is $150 cheaper than his machine made black cardigan. So we're hoping to disrupt on a few points, not the least of which raising the price of the garment so that knitters can, number one, earn a living year round. Um, you know, sweaters should be, uh, consumed in the fall and the winter and uh, so many of the knitters are sort of tied into the tourism uh, trade and so they're sort of stuck selling in the spring and summer which um i think i think we're going to be able to accomplish that and then the the wool mill is the bigger problem and that's something that i think we'll uh, probably have some deeper conversations with some of the nations um and some other partners to see about 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 that because 
there's a lot of sheep in this region. And, you know, we've been talking to a couple of them through this process and they all bury their wool right now and running out of space to bury their wool because there's no one to take it on anymore. The, the last wool mill on the island in BC closed in 2007. And um, unless, you're, unless you're really connected or you can tap into some of this local wool source like at Joni's store, then you rely on some of the stores that are buying your sweaters to purchase wool from as well. So buying buying the wool at retail, but selling the sweaters at wholesale and kind of on either end, not not getting the the best deal possible. Yeah. Luann, you've you've been an art an ad, advocate for artists um, for many years. What should people know about Indigenous intellectual property rights? Well, that's a nice big question. <laughs> <laughs> Just like my other question, I said, how are how are the rights handed down? And you said, well, there's 48 cultural groups, so that's going to take some time. <laughs> yeah, it's um, uh, it, it's been a long journey. Uh, I, I sometimes feel like I'm getting nowhere, but I uh, also feel like uh, every inch forward makes a difference. Um, it, sometimes it's just getting the right people. And by that, I mean uh, the politicians. Uh, we don't have in Canada uh, sufficient copyright and intellectual property protections. Our legislation is lacking. Our legislation lacks teeth. There's no regulations attached to the legislation, so there's no um, repercussions for um, contravening the, the legislation. So copyright law says you can't copy any artist's work. And I always say that uh, to Canadian artists, like whatever improvements we make for Indigenous people is going to benefit all Canadian artists. Because right now, if somebody steals your art, and I've had this happen several times with my own artwork, someone steals your art, the, you'd be lucky if they even get a slap on the wrist. Right now, we're just fortunate to have social media to um, bring attention when, when there's been a contravention of somebody's rights or an infringement of someone's rights. So I think what we have to do is, uh, is keep pushing for this conversation to happen, get our own politicians involved. We have not had a great deal of support from our own political organizations and understandable that you know there are really pressing issues on all fronts, but this is one of them. This is part and parcel. When we talk about uh, even the BC treaty process, culture, our culture, this art, uh, all the things that have been said so far are, are interwoven into that. So let's not just push it to the side and call it craft or, or uh, some commercial venture. And this is important to the baseline of our economy, of our own economies and our uh, different communities. So we have lots of work to do on legislation. We need to take it to that next step. And we definitely need to make sure that there's conversations both with the politicians and each community around what intellectual property rights mean to those specific nations. It's different everywhere. And I think that's the thing, the biggest lesson I think that we can share with the public is um, set aside this assumption that there's a one size fits all for all nations uh, in BC and, and across Canada. There isn't. Um, it's complex. It's going to take a lot of work. Uh, that's why I just keep hanging on because I just think it's worth having these discussions and it's worth making this difference. I think that's how we're going to see diverse local economies and see prosperity for our artists in the future as well. I agree with you. Absolutely. So what should, again, for you, Luann, what should consumers consider when purchasing Indigenous art? Uh, definitely check always to see if uh, the names of the artists are attached to the work. Uh, oftentimes you'll see, you will see tags that will have the artist's name on it, but look really closely at who is producing the item. Uh, there's a couple of considerations here. Artists will put tags on their own work uh, sometimes. That's not a widespread practice yet, but that's what I've been helping to uh, push and to inform artists about how important it is to do that and their contact information, whether it's a website or even social media, so that the um, consumer can actually look them up even right there in the store. They should be able to look them up and see if this artist is benefiting from the sale of this work. Oftentimes what happens is artists, because of the, the, the lack of channels available, will do limited licensing agreements with larger companies and these larger companies um, might pay them 5% royalty. 
uh, when the standard, and there isn't a, a given standard, but the general standard is starts at 15%. Um, so an artist is lucky if they get as much as 5%. What I've heard artists say is, is they might get 2% is kind of the going rate. So if, if it's just pushing the artist further into poverty by buying this thing, reconsider that. I'll also ask the shop owners if they can point you towards items that were brought in directly by the artist and sold and that is going to benefit the artist directly. Um, the other thing is there are a few shops in, in many of our different tourist locations um, that are owned and operated by Indigenous people. And also consider if you like something that you see in the shop and you don't need to buy it this exact moment, get a picture of the artist's name because most artists have turned to online sales and you can buy directly from the artist. Not only can you buy what you've seen in a shop, but you can usually custom order something um, in particular. So lots of different options that weren't there 20, 30 years ago. When I started working in galleries when I was in high school, um, there were only a few shops that, that had uh, authentic pieces made by Indigenous people, no uh, mass-produced works at that time. But we're really into mass production now, and it really blurs the issue a lot. But you can always contact the artist directly. It's really helpful. I made notes myself on, on some of those. Christmas shopping coming up, hey? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think it's it. a lot of it is on us. I mean, well, we, we, we need to push the government to make changes. But consumers, when we purchase, we need to be paying. Just like orange shirts. There were lots of orange shirt sales and you needed and, and social media was excellent for reminding people to pay attention who's producing the shirts and where's the funding going to. If I could share one last thing, I worked on an initiative a couple of years back, about five years ago, with uh, Shane Jackson from Seashelt and he, he's in North Van now. Um, but we it was called Authentic Indigenous and we were working to get authentic tag system that had three tiers. One, if it's directly made by the artist, all handmade controlled by the artist, meaning if they did mass produce, they were in charge of that. That was a tier two. And tier three was these licensing agreements. Uh, the trouble with that, that whole system was not that the system wasn't a good idea. Everybody loved it. The artists loved it. The galleries, the museum, gift shops, everybody wanted these tags. We couldn't get any funders to back us. And I, I mean, all we were doing was printing tags and getting them out for free to the artists so that they could use them because here we were telling artists use tags and then they'd have to go and expend the money. And so we were looking for a consistent look and something really quick that a, a tier one, tier two, tier three, that the consumer would know just immediately when they saw that number one, they knew it was a handmade original. So I think that as consumers, as citizens, if advocating and reminding your MLA, remind your MP that we deserve as much support from the policy initiatives they do and the program initiatives they do as anybody else. Uh, this, this was not an expensive initiative. It would have taken, um, you know, comparatively speaking, pennies a day to support this initiative and completely change the way consumers got to see our products. Yeah, and I remember I remember that initiative and, and it wasn't, I didn't realize why it languished and it's really unfortunate because it got me thinking about, you know, sometimes it is okay to buy manufactured good, um, but you need to know who's being compensated for the design plus are there royalties for the work. Mm -hmm. I manufacture my own greeting cards and, you know, I work with local printers, I keep the money local, I use Indigenous suppliers wherever I can, and, and so I had a lot of tier two items. Um, and, and it would have made such a difference, and it did make a difference. The summer I got to put my tags on my tier two products, uh, it changed the way my, my um, work got out there. And it also opened up new doors for me to collaborate and do licensing agreements on other products. So it, all, it doesn't just make the opportunity for direct sales the opportunities for artists to get invited to residencies, to be part of exhibits. Uh, there's so many other things that artists can do to um, share their work out there in the world and, and become partners with other uh, entrepreneurs as well. Yes. Joni, I wanted to ask you a similar question. What can we do as consumers to protect knitters in particular from exploitation? Yeah, well, I'm pretty, I'm, I feel like Luann covered a lot of it as she was speaking. I was like, yes, yeah, that's the answer to my question too. 
Um, you know, I own a company who, uh, um, you know, we're working on artist profiles at, at the moment in time. Um, I'm not a huge company, so I'm not going to be able to purchase, I'm sure, as much as what knitters are going to want me to purchase from them. So putting their business cards into the shop so that people can directly order straight from the knitter. Um, there's sort of a gap, um, like Ron said, you know, in the winter time, our knitters are getting a ton of calls straight to the knitter for personal orders and they get backed up in their personal orders. And then in the spring and the summer, they don't have any buyers, but still need to be making some income. So per being able to, me being able to purchase for a fair price, um, their goods off of them in the off seasons, give them a place, uh, to sell, um, historically, uh, in, in the business, uh, my parents paid, um, uh, I think 30 or 40% more than what Sasquatch was paying for a sweater. So that's always on my mind is, um, you know, if a, if in that busy season, a knitter brings me their sweater to sell, I'm not going to look to make any money off of their sweater. They can sell it in my shop. I'm not looking even for a commission. If they, if I have to purchase it in, let's say June and I have to carry that cost over, I might look for, you know, 10%, but I'm not looking to make money off of other knitters. I'm just looking to provide a place for them to, to sell. Um, same with the wool sales. Anybody who is knitting uh, for a living, any First Nations women who are knitting for a living, I sell them the wool at cost. I don't make any money off of the wool that I sell them. And I've been doing that for four or five years. Um, and I, I bring it in and I sell it out of my basement right now because my shop is still under construction. And um, it's all just been kind of word of mouth. Wool, as Ron said, is, you know, it's a, it's a problem, um, especially from black sheep, believe it or not, everybody raises white sheep. So Ron, as you get into the industry, get a, get a, get black sheep onto some of those fields, because right now my supplier who's in Carstairs, Alberta, it's all BC and Alberta wool. Um, she, she, we have a really, really great partnership. I've helped her design wools that come out um, sort of chunkier, sort of that sort of recognizable sort of cow chin spun. Um, she didn't offer that to begin with. So we partnered to sort of create that and create the resource for knitters. And um, it's September, in September, I purchased all the rest of her black wool for the year. And so she's tried starting to resource it from the United States because she can't even get black wool to process. White wool, yes, but I mean, part of that, uh, the the sweater is that natural undyed wool um so we could get dyed black wool um but and then if somebody washes their white sweater with a black print it 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 becomes kind of a gray sweater so ha answering some of the wool questions um you know uh is for me as a business owner not just a knitter is so that we're not exploiting knitters in a before they even get their product to to, to, to be um, sold. Um, but labeling properly, I mean, customers definitely should be doing their research. Um, they could definitely uh, just know simple facts like uh, like an um, uh, Indigenous made sweater is going to have a drop sleeve rather than a raglan sleeve. So there's some identifiers that you can look at, uh, you know, you sort of see on these used marketplace well, I'm selling a couch and sweater. And quite often I'll go in and say, that's not a couch and sweater. I can tell just by looking at it, it's not a couch and sweater. And I'll, and they'll say, oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But, um, you know, just educating people on, on what it actually is, making sure that you are buying direct from the knitter as often as possible, asking stores about their knitters, like making them answer to those questions and then uh shopping from indigenous like owned places is also a good idea i'm not here to promote myself but artist profiles are very important very important so i've always labeled labeled my goods and i've always labeled goods that i've sold for other people also i had my late aunt diane as a knitter she knit she could knit 150 toques a year that's all she liked to knit um, and I made sure that everybody knew that they were not knit by me, they were knit by her. So, um, um, yeah, so I think that just asking those questions 
um, doing your research and sort of knowing some identifiers of what you're actually out there looking for is really important too, because there's some really simple ways of telling also. Great, thank you. We have so much to learn. And that really brings us, to Dr. Thiessen, <laughs> to you. And, and while I ask you these questions, I invite the audience to, to think of your own questions and start typing those into the, to the Q and A, uh, so we can we can learn as much as possible in the time that we have with this panel. So, Suzanne, what does intellectual property research look like from an Indigenous perspective? How is it different? Oh, um, mute. It's been two years, I still haven't mastered the turn on the volume. So uh, not a knitter, but uh, really, and not really an artist and uh, really, really grateful to the, the wisdom and experience of uh, Luann and Joni and Ron. Um, so I jumped into this project uh, as, a, as a researcher, originally uh, wanting to look at ocean and marine technology. Um, and, you know, being a Haida Gitsan person who, was from an island growing up on another island, very, very connected to coast and marine. Um, but when this uh, project around the, the sweaters came up and uh, and the, a product that I'm, I was very familiar with just growing up, um, really wanted to jump at the opportunity. For me, I see um, several things uh, that that need um, sort of examination and support, and that's why this team is is so well positioned. Uh, the business end itself, um, and as Joni as Ron were saying, making sure that uh, the artists and producers um, have fair access and have ethical access, um, to, not only to to raw materials but to markets. Um, these these pieces are heirlooms, right? Um, there are. They're, they should be elevated to a status that is uh, much higher than than somebody would be sort of accessing through a common tourist store. But most importantly for me is is the um, the exploitation that I see in the industry um, stopping. And uh, you know we, we see people designers, um, contemporary designers, and I probably can't say them, but uh, I think people are aware they're out there. You know, you see the ads on Facebook, you see them in department stores where um, our work is being completely copied and exploited, and that's just wrong. And as Luann was saying, there's no real um, place um, in Canadian law for that to be addressed and stopped. And I think the problem um, is that these laws weren't written to protect Indigenous people or communities. These laws were um, written for other purposes. And I think now as well, um, if you consider human rights, you know, even outside of intellectual property law, human rights and Indigenous rights as as human rights, there's a connection there that isn't being recognized in the law either, and it's problematic. So I think through, um, you know, work. My my job is basically to to listen and to share the stories and share it in a way that will give weight and add tools for uh, the knitters and anybody who's supporting the knitters um, to convince government, to convince the the lawmakers that policy needs to shift and there needs to be protections. The um, the system that Luann is describing would work very well, but again, that needs to be supported and it also needs to have legal backing to it. Um, so the research just kind of adds that um, support to a different audience uh, that maybe uh, hasn't hasn't had an opportunity to be heard yet or has been, but uh, it might be in other areas. So there's lots of information um, and a whole group of, of probably lawyers working on intellectual property, but very little um, from an Indigenous lens and an Indigenous perspective. And this project, because it's localized to uh, the island or, and Coast Salish, probably you know, stretching down across uh, not our only um, Canadian recognized jurisdictions, it's localized. Um, but it can be, uh, others can learn from it. Others can learn from the stories and the experiences that the knitters are having here and their successes. So um, does, that, does that answer your question? It does, and it, and it uh, someone answers the next question too, and that how might your work that you're doing collectively focused on knitting be of value to other indigenous artists or textile producers? 
Okay. Uh, well, I guess in the application, if we can, can this the, the study I'm involved in is has been supported by the Innovation Asset Collective, which are an arm of government outside of government in Canada that are really interested in amplifying um, the ability for uh, creative people, artists, entrepreneurs to protect their work. Um, so. If we can, uh, you know, provide them with enough information for them to start shifting and informing and shape shaping policy, just in this in this small industry, it has application to other industries. Yes, and and like Luann was saying, as there's application for artists and you know intellectual pro property more generally, if we start to enforce these things and take them seriously um, across the board in Canada. Sure. And I, and I think where the complexity starts to come into play is we're not talking about um, an, an image. So like the image that Luann has created behind her, you know, if somebody took a screenshot and figured out how to fill in the places behind her and started to use it, she could look at that image and say, that's my art, it's copywritten. With the knitting, it's, it is known by the knitters who whose family does which cuffs and which which border panels and how they do their eagles differently than that family it is it is something that is only understood by the knitters themselves and it is something that the knitter chooses to teach someone so it might be a neighbor who's taken an interest and they teach them this is how this is this is the cuff this cuff belongs to my family and i'm teaching it to you you're not infringing on the copyright because I'm teaching it to you. Where it gets complicated in, in um, Suzanne's work is that it is not traditional copyright. You know, it's something that we inherit, that we pass on. It's something that we don't own. We share it and teach it, and that's how it lives on. So it, it's complicated, even in the mechanics of us putting this research project forward going to going to the ethics uh council is it a council going to the ethics to talk about consent well indigenous people especially those of a certain age are very reluctant to sign any piece of paper with a whole bunch of language they don't understand but if you seek their consent i heard you ask for their consent you pay me as a witness in keeping with the oral traditions of our people, I can sign a paper to say, yes, I know consent was given. So even, even in presenting that idea into the academy to say, this is how we want to do this research project, following our own teachings around, around legal, legal documents, you know, the, with the oral tradition. So even on the surface, this is really hard to, hard to, wrap our heads around with the current knowledge that we have, we have to create something very new. Yes, Suzanne. Sure, I just wanted to thank you, Ron, follow, uh, follow up on that and say yes, like our, even the approach to research with the, you know, um, that's also a disruption. And though it's it's just a small disruption, it's it's one small study, it sets a, a practice into place. And then from that practice, there's a ripple and others can then can then do the, the same. And it strengthens, um, not that we need to have our legitimacy strengthened, but it strengthens it um, throughout this, the system that we're dealing with that we have to navigate. Yeah, the idea of um, witnessed oral agreements. Yeah, it's, a, it's an innovation for, say, for the university. It's an innovation for them so to use ancient wisdom um, as a, a new old way of doing things. I think, too, maybe if I could jump in and, and as Luann and Joni were talking about, that's also, a, it's a disruption, but it's also an, an innovation um, as well. So, I mean, I'm inspired by the, the work of the artists, and I'm also really inspired um, by the, the strength of, of community and the fact that, you know, most of the knitters are women. Most of them have been uh, doing this for many, many years to support families. And uh, I think that's a, a, real, a real strength, too, of the work and also of the art. Yes. We have our first question from the audience. This one is anonymous. And I'll ask the question and perhaps someone can volunteer to, to answer it. 
Many small businesses choose to not file patents simply because it's very expensive to defend, even when a competitor steals IP. What are the alternatives for Indigenous artists and entrepreneurs where legal aspects just aren't feasible? Can we elevate the brand of Indigenous authenticity as a strategy to increase their profit margins and access to markets as an alternative to simply trying to protect? Luann? <laughs> well, I was I spotted that question. I thought, oh, I, I want to say something about that. Um, you're right. Uh, I looked into copyright because I was going to follow all the rules and see how far it got me. Uh, and then I just wasn't willing to spend that kind of money. I thought, you know, uh, under the Copyright Act, it says that the moment you create something as an artist, it's your copyright protected. Done deal. You don't need to register. You don't need to pay the 75 bucks or whatever it is they charge. Um, and, and I actually followed up and called and emailed everybody and said, how does this work? So somebody infringes my, my uh, pieces that I paid for the copyright protection. And they said, oh, well, we'll just provide you with a certificate uh, validating that you did register it. And I said, well, then who pays the court fees? Who hires the lawyer? Do I have to pay for all that? Um, so what this person's remark is so accurate, it's very expensive. And, and in the end, usually doesn't result in the artist making anything back. Um, you set a new precedent and then it goes nowhere because so it's a it's a little bit of a vicious cycle. Um, I think what we need to do, and it was something Suzanne said, reminded me that we have this is a time in BC, especially that we become very aware and not try to ignore the fact that we have the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And in BC, we have the Declaration Act. So every government agency, every crown corporation is required to map out exactly how they're going to um, align with the UN Declaration. Um, I think that, that what that means is that gives us a little step up in BC in particular to start figuring out things like those tag systems, things like the discussions, like real meaningful formal discussions so that we're going to get somewhere, um, defining what we mean by intellectual property. I think about with the couch and sweaters, with my own designs from my own territory, which is the Kwakwakiwak, those form line designs are pretty obvious. You know, you can't look at designs like this and say that came from the interior. This came from the coast. It belongs to us. It's always belonged to us. I'm, I've heard people say, you know, our designs are sacred. And in, and there's a, a group of designs or a, a, a sphere, I suppose, um, of each tribe recognizes which designs are sacred and that the artists keep those for the community itself. And then we're starting, and we have been in modern times, been deciding amongst ourselves and sometimes individually, what do we share publicly? Those become, I think, in, uh, the artist's copyright, the artist's individual IP when you think about it in the Canadian context. There's a big gap between that. There's a gap between all of that history, what, how form line design came to be over a millennia and, and what we use it for now. And there's nothing right now that defines all of that. So I think the uh, UN Declaration and the Declaration Act for BC are an uh, amazing opportunity for us to get voice. I think that where it needs to start is our own communities really need to get vocal, need to get together. I would love to see some of our artists come together. Uh, I'd love to have it happen next summer when we can be outside and safe and have some discussions, like real pointed discussions about what we're going to do. If we leave it for government to um, figure it out and define it, I've been waiting 35 years, got nowhere. So I think we need to have our own discussions, decide what we want, and we'll put something on the table for the, and the, the politicians can respond to what we put on the table. That might be something that the Indigenous Prosperity Center uh, could help with convening, uh, bringing folks together and then helping to amplify the, the information that comes out of that. So That'd definitely be, be asking the, the committee to consider mm -hmm. um, that important work. So now people are probably intimidated by the quality of the first question. <laughs> the, um, any question is a good question. <laughs> um, uh, well, the, one of the things that we weren't sure whether we'd have time to talk about that I'd like to ask you about, Ron, is, is there a documentary in the works on this topic? There is. So this project has um, spun off Every time we say something out loud about it, somebody else uh, comes up with an idea on how to connect with it. And that's how um, 
how SIP and, and Suzanne got connected to this was I was just having a, a conversation with the new CEO and and it was just as we were standing up and putting our coats and oh yeah, this is what we're working on. And and now we have this research happening. Uh, the documentary came about, we were saying we should do a one minute, two minute, three minute video that people could link to on a website or something, trying to understand you know the history and our connection to this to this garment and the and the and the art that is attached to it. And um, my friend Renee from Ecologist said, "Well, let me introduce you to uh, the producer from Ecologist Films, and we'll set up a meeting and we'll figure out when we can shoot it and figure out how much it's going to cost." And you know, we're thinking five or ten thousand dollars for one or two minutes. And and we went from confirming a meeting on one afternoon to meeting the next evening and uh the gentleman came in 10 minutes late drops all of his bags on the table and said i have an update and he said i'm late because i answered the phone as i was leaving the door and my friend from cbc has just had a documentary pull out of a series that they're airing next year called absolutely canadian and do you do you know anything that could fit into this criteria a documentary about something that's made in Canada? And he said, well, I'm on my way to this meeting. What do you think about this? And she went, perfect. Send me two pages and we'll answer right away. And so he said, should I send two pages? He did. They answered right away. So they've they've given us a licensing agreement. APTN has since come on and for a for, uh, uh, simultaneous broadcast. Um, and other funders are, are starting to line up now as well. So we are going to start production. Uh, it was supposed to be, it was actually supposed to be this week, but we had to delay um, to discuss ethics about the fact that VNFC is uh, executive producer on this. And we are also going to be selling couch and sweaters at some point. Um, so that's happening. We, we just had a meeting yesterday with CBC to discuss um, the NFC's role and if we should stay involved or if we should restructure they said no this is you do so much great work and you're obviously you know not going to be exploiting this you're not going to be exploiting the knitters you're doing this um for charitable non nonprofit um on a charitable nonprofit basis so yeah so we're going to be filming over the next six months or so and hopefully it'll go to broadcast uh, in the fall that's exciting Uh, we have another question. Is there a way to designate Indigenous knowledge for the purpose of consultations and other things such as consulting services, the intangibles? So like, how do we, I'm, 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 my interpretation of that is how do we determine what is Indigenous knowledge when we're talking about consultation and, and other things such as consulting services? Luann does not want to answer the question. Well, no, I just I I feel like that like we're missing something there. Uh, I I'm not sure what they're asking because uh, I don't know. That's that's kind of broad. Yeah, I'm wondering if they're speaking in particular about um, consultation. When do you need to consult because the knowledge isn't is indigenous? I, I almost interpret the question a little bit differently because I think you know this has actually come up in in other circles where. Um, elders are engaged to come in and do uh, words of welcome or opening prayers or connecting to a class um, about their cultural knowledge and teaching. And I think the idea of a subject matter, subject matter expert and somebody who is as, as a cultural practice, um, you know, sharing their knowledge is built into their, into their DNA does not mean that you can pay them with a branded coffee mug. It means you should pay them a, a, a proper consulting fee. So I'm not sure if that's if that's what the question um, was about, but I think this idea of, you know, someone like Luann or Joni or Suzanne or, Chris, or Christina or myself, you know, we're often asked to come in and be a part of a discussion group or a consultation and, and you're paid in coffee mugs and light refreshments. So I think I think in the that context, being able to assign value to indigenous knowledge and paying people to give advice in this space 
yes. it should be respected. And so even for the documentary, we have built in fees that we can share with uh, with people. You know, if you're going to take an hour away from knitting, you know, this is what we think that might be worth. And I think you're correct with your interpretation. The author said clarification services that are not tangibles like arts and knitting, but are drawing upon knowledge. So quite correctly, when there's, a, there's an off an awful lot of requesting for for knowledge, and it needs to be understood that that <clears throat> the value, the real value of the mm. knowledge that is being asked about. If I weigh it, wait. Oh, sorry. Yeah, please do. Oh, is someone else going to weigh in there? Sorry. I, yeah, I was just going to say that um, to support what Ron and Christina have both said. Um, it is something of value that we're being asked to provide. So, uh, you know, <laughs> people have not had any problem paying uh, non-Indigenous consultants for opinion um, and uh, research and guidance for many, many years. So um, now Indigenous people are getting asked for very, very specific uh, knowledge that, um, you know, only they can provide and it, it needs to be um, recognized and compensated for appropriately um, as and this is one thing about the research in in um, an indigenous research strategy those honorariums and that recognition is built into the budget and uh, back to disrupting um, sometimes when our EBs or research ethic, ethics boards are reviewing those budgets they question the ethics of paying somebody a, an honorarium or a fee for their knowledge. So um, that's questioned as being um, anti-ethical when actually it's it's the opposite. It's it's the recognition and reward. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm glad you said you ended off with the word ethics at the end there, because uh, when I worked at uh, several post-secondary institutions, this came up a few times where I actually ended up looking at the ethics requirements and agreements and, and the policy, I was looking at it through the policy lens. And even that needs to be disrupted and, and redone. It was, we're not coming from the same place in our ethics. Uh, you can meet university academic uh, ethics. Um, you know, they're, they're there, they're, they're longstanding. And because they're so longstanding and you get that, we've always done it this way. Um, there's a real resistance to taking a look at that and understanding that maybe those ethics policies aren't complete uh, any, any longer, or they don't apply the same way any longer, particularly with the lens of the UN, UN declaration. So I think that uh, to the person's question, um, the question almost is the cart before the horse now, because we have to back up a couple of steps here and talk about who's, whose ethics are we talking about? From our community's perspective, you share intellectual property. It's not so that you as the researcher can, just because you paid an honoraria for the person's time, doesn't mean you now own the information. And this is what we get with visual artists. I bought your painting. Why can't I reproduce it on t-shirts and sell it for, you know, for my own profit? Well, you didn't buy the copyright. You just bought the item. So um, I think uh, across Canada, really North America, there's a real lack, and this is something I've recommended over and over again to the Department of Canadian Heritage, because I think they're partially responsible for getting more information out there to citizens to understand. Yeah, there's, there's, there's some very distinct lines here around ownership and usership, um, and social media blurs that a lot. Uh, but why aren't we talking about that? And why aren't we trying to get somewhere new? Just because there's policy doesn't mean it's engraved in stone and has to stay that way forever. Canada's still a work in progress, and so are most of our policies. And I think that ethics policies also need that, that revisit. I feel like we should be further along on these issues at, in 2022 than we are. Um, yeah. But maybe we're at a time where there's an openness to learn um, and, and an openness to share and aligned at the same time. We have a couple of other questions and we've got, we've got just a few minutes left. Uh, one question is, will there be a place like a directory where consumers can find authentic Indigenous art, good, goods and services? I know of one, which I'll name, and then if anyone else knows of another, the there is a South Island Indigenous business directory just getting started. It was a it started from the Greater Victoria Harbour Authority and then CRD, City of Victoria and South Island Prosperity Partnership contributed funding to help um, launch a website that lists Indigenous businesses on the South Island. And the, so Indigenous businesses will be invited to, to register there. And um, 
and consumers can go to learn more about those businesses. And that will be a work in progress, how that how that unfolds and there's um, opportunities for feedback from Indigenous businesses that use that directory to refine it. So we we'll look forward to, to seeing that launch and, and um, having that at least be for the South Island a place to start in finding um, Indigenous businesses. Can I just jump in? I think I think that's going to be an excellent resource for uh, you know smaller entrepreneurs who don't have a large budget to market or I'm just familiar to um, starting a website uh, just to get their name in the directory that will have um, accessibility is is a great start. Yes. The chamber is having a mixer on the 22nd at the Songhees Wellness Center, uh, highlighting some of their Indigenous members. So. Um, I think putting some pressure on the Chambers of Commerce to follow suit. I know that the Victoria Chamber of Commerce has waived their membership fees for Indigenous businesses. So Joni, if you want to be a member of the Victoria Chamber, you can just say you're Indigenous. But um, I think that sort of thing, connecting to people in that way, connecting to other businesses that way, you know, I think the other thing to think about is it's just not the direct to consumer, but there are organizations who do a lot of procurement in gift in giftware and and you know honorary and dignitary yes. gifts and and so looking at those procurement policies and and connecting in this way directly to indigenous businesses is uh, great and it's just it is a good time and I think Christina your question about you know I th we should be farther along we're farther along than a lot of other regions. I think, you know, the nations are standing up for their people. There's associations now, places like SIP who has spun off to the Indigenous um, Prosperity Center and things like that. So, you know, we, we are pretty far behind if we compare ourselves to places like New Zealand and, um, but we're farther ahead than some other regions. So let's just sort of count our blessings. And, and Luann's only been doing this since she was four years old, 35 years. Um, and, <laughs> and, you know, I think, you know, and I talk about the fact that we're going to be doing this for the rest of our lives, but I think the needle is moving and we can't see it because we're standing on top of it, but it is moving forward. Agree. And the uh, the uh, initiative I worked on a few years ago, uh, Authentic Indigenous, I think the website's still up. I think they, they uh, and it's being kept alive by Indigenous Tourism BC. So it was meant to cover all of BC. Um, I hope that they get the support to keep that site running and also just to, uh, bring back the tags and get things going again. Okay. Um, one of the things I'd like to see artists do, and I'll I'll start championing this in, in, in all my free time, um, is getting a couple of hashtags that we can share out to the public to help with their search engine and be able to yeah. just find us. Uh, because that direct to artists is so special. I always appreciate when people reach out directly to me. So, uh, but I've been really working hard to make sure people can do that. So uh, I think there's other things we can do on the ground in the meantime as well. I agree. And we, we're, we're winding down here. I just want to quickly say that Catherine Deleuze made a comment. Um, have you considered QR codes on tags? And uh, I think that that we'll just leave that there, that QR codes. Great idea to get a lot of information and information that can change in the background and the codes stay the same. So that might be an efficient, efficient way to get information on to tags. So thank you so much for sharing. Uh, we could have talked for another hour and still be scratching the surface of this really important issue. I also want to thank Capital Daily for sponsoring this conversation and thank the presenting sponsors RBC and Catalyst sponsor Van City for supporting Rising Economy 2022. And I thank you attendees and encourage you to head back to the WOVA platform for to continue talking. And up next at 2 p.m., what's the verdict? Can impact investment humanize capitalism? Thank you for joining us for this session of the Rising Economy 2022.